So today's uh, question is from John W. Last week, John O. All right. I'm wondering um, if you go into the topic of chasing the light and solutions in greater detail in any of your other videos. Actually, I don't. I don't know how much I do, and I don't remember which one you actually were referring to this time either. I do always treat it in a side-winding way, and you know, I mentioned a couple things that I have heard about typically and some of the things that I do. Similarly, I'm also wondering what techniques could be used to capture fleeting expressions, scenes in motion, or ensembles. You know, the use of the imagination is pretty significant in all these sorts of things. The ability to draw initially and empower yourself with just plain still life drawing, you know, cast drawing, something that holds still. If you can't do that, don't even get ambitious. Don't get thoughtful about 10 other things. <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things. So if that's an ambition that you're not ready for, you know, that's one thing. But um, chasing the light, uh, if you're a landscape painter, uh, you know, you saw uh, bunker going out there and not chasing the light. He went out to a, on a gray day where it stayed gray and he could sit out there a very long time and uh, the light didn't change very much. I mean, even on a gray day, there's a certain movement of the light as the day moves over, but uh, sun moves over behind the clouds. But a gray day is a classic expression for for a cloudy day. So uh, what, um, what I'm going to do is... Um, just show you some stuff that I've done, some of the stuff you've seen before, but if I'm suggesting that one of the things you can do is begin to develop your memory. It's probably the key thing. The two things together are memory and imagination, right? In terms of trying to do anything that's, that's transitory, that's, uh, transient, I guess would be a better word for it, fleeting. So you've seen these before, I think, some version of them. These are, these are all 30 second looks, maybe up to a minute, but not likely, right? You see the bottom right one out of the rear view of my car. Now these are pastels, they're done, um, well if your screen is the size of mine, it's one of these 13 inch screens, then um, those are probably pretty close to life size. Uh, you know, they're very small postage stamp, well bigger than the postage stamp, but uh, you know, they're typically, you know, uh, two by three at the maximum, once in a while one gets to four inches. But these are just fascinating things, and you know I remembered key things about them. Uh, I used a I, I used a strategy of just naming the red, the yellow, and the blue without meaning that, with just simply saying red, yellow, blue. What shall we call the yellow in this picture? What should we call the blue? And sometimes, like in the bottom right one, left one there, I'd say, well, we call this the blue, and there's a blue too. And I just noticed that there were two different blues. I'd noticed movements in the reds, or the movement of the red into the blue, the yellow into the orange, those sorts of things. You just pick them up or grand things, grand movements, like the difference of this value in the sky back here getting to this color over here. You can pick those things up in a matter of seconds. This is the landscape, you know, some dark greenish thing that has almost no color. Um, you know, some, some with more or less success. Um, these were actually clouds in the sky, uh, and there was a little light very strange cloud, something I hadn't seen before. It's part of the reason I looked at it. And there's this red light sitting right there on the hilltop. No idea what it was. And, um, and, one, and one lonely star, that sort of thing. But yeah, you can see the rear view mirror, you know, the mirror itself will tend to yellow the, uh, the painting. But so these are transitory. Every one of these is a transitory effect. It's the key is memory. I'm going to show you a few more of them and then get out of here. But you know, the moon there, you might be able to look at that fairly long time. Moons will typically sit there for a while and not change much. But still, I was driving in a car and I wasn't stopping the car to stare at the moon. So, um, yeah, so if you're doing that one, two, three, red, yellow, blue, you're also very aware of the three values. There'll be differences typically in three masses, you know, this value here versus this one versus this one. Those are things you'll notice if you let yourself notice, if you think too much, you won't be using your eyes and your visual memory won't be kicking in. So you, you got to start to watch out for words, but words can be the, you know, the glue for the, if, as long as they're the glue for the, um, for the colors. And I find that I do need a version of glue in a word. So you can see in this one here that my, if you want to call it that, this is my yellow, obviously, this is my blue. So where's the red? So the moon took that place. And, uh, Etc. Etc. Right. This is a tree. I wasn't trying to draw every single branch in that tree, but I was trying to get the essential ones. Uh, so there was a certain amount of memory 
of key aspects of that tree, including this odd one breaking through here, just some of the odd things I picked up as I looked at the tree in a big way. But this was a little snow, um, you know, the newspaper that uh, Robert Frost describes, <laughs> uh, you know, late, um, late winter. Red, yellow, blue, though, here's the red. V variations on it, perhaps, and the, uh, the blue up here, and there's the yellow. And uh, so it goes. You, but that's 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 all I do. But those are every one of these is a blink. I, I wouldn't try it. I wouldn't stand out there for ten minutes trying to memorize this. Transient effects, okay. And some of them, of course, the shapes of clouds like this will change so dramatically. Um, this thing here, these might last more or less long. But I'm driving in a car. Each of these things, I'm driving in a car. So you can probably see what the essential thing is there. I could see this blue was turning off into this yellow up and through here, and I could see that this darker blue was turning into this, or was pinked up, was formed a background for this other, for this lighter red here. But the key is the visual memory, not, not words or anything like that. But that's, that's color. That's the game. Color values, memorize, memorize, memorize. But, and then what? The rest is imagination, right? Um, and I just did it, by the way. How about I? I don't know. I forgot that I had had this other quote in here. Uh, could you briefly comment on how you linked the memory study into the imaginative painting of Dawn? Oh, that's right. So, for instance, did you use a model in the original memory study, or did you simply capture the color relationships on alternative forms and later apply them to a live model? Yeah, I think I can answer your questions here. Um, uh, but before I go to to images, uh, I want to say that I had this, I had this image of my grandfather gardening in Colorado with that with the sun hitting him, and this early morning sun hitting him, and the day being as clear as crystal as Colorado days so frequently are, and uh, and uh, there's a memory there that I've never been able to shake, and this model comes the nearest uh, to anything I've ever done that's entirely from a memory of a day. Uh, so if you just said that. You have some idea what I was doing. That's the entire painting is is memory based, uh, and uh, <laughs> I'll talk about some other stuff that I did that I that I regret sort of doing. And this painting, by the way, is a work in perpetual progress. By the way, <laughs> so I've shown it in various iterations, still not not none of which are fully satisfying to me. If you haven't done it before, I mean, make sure you always show your work somewhere because you see it with much better, more objective eyes when you see it on the wall. Uh, and, and everybody can look at it. It's amazing how good, it is. no matter how old you get, that's a useful thing to do. Uh, so did uh, the question was, did I, for instance, use a model in the original memory study? Well, w w it depends on what you mean by a memory study, but um, how I linked the memory study into the imaginative painting of Dawn. So you're assuming some things here, so let me just talk about what I did, okay? Or did I entirely capture the color relationships on alternative forms and later apply them to a life model. Well, sort of neither, but that certainly is true of the clouds, okay? So this is the dawn. This is the le left one is the more is the later one of the later versions of it. This is the memory drawing you just saw a second ago. And this isn't one of my more impressive memory drawings, but there was enough in my mind that I knew I could do variations on that idea, you know, getting enough intensity in the in the clouds and so on, but it, you can see I made a different color of day. It's a my day. The, my entire painting is got more on the gold side, um, and um, whereas this evening was obviously bluer, cooler, cooler overall, including the uh, top of the you know this whole area here. This is a this is by the way um, memory of Colorado. This is a memory, literal memory of of, of uh, uh, a view into Vermont uh, from. Uh, I-91, the highway that goes down between two states, down through, through uh, to, to down all the way to New York. Um, but this is one of the variations. This is a color study. So I had an idea for a pose, and um, I didn't, I, the pose is entirely fictional. So these are all these variations were just attempts, including this one, still an attempt. Uh, by the way, this one, I want to say this whole area should, should appear darker, um, and that's one of those things where this whole unity here, it would be, it, the whole painting would be much more impressive, at least in its photographs, if it was more unified like this one is, right? But you can see what I'm doing with all these things, with the trees in the background here, there's, there's variations, I'm just hunting and hunting, this is all out of my head, so this is what you call an imaginative painting. Um, uh, 
But yeah, so you can call this a fleeting effect. It's a time of morning and the sun's gradually going up. Shadows are hitting right here, but they won't be hitting there for long. It's like they're coming over a mountaintop and the mountain, literally, that's literally the line of the mountain uh, or whatever object you would be blocking it. Uh, so the figure's a memory figure. Everything about, the, everything about this is memorized except for one thing, and that is that I made out of my head. I did a sculpture of this figure and use it for some reference. So that's another one of those strategies you can use. It's easier to sometimes to get a three-dimensional figure. It's certainly easier to show, to create a figure and then put a light on it. Uh, and you can make these out of plaster that can be painted and stuff like that. Um, I forget what it's called. There's a modeling plaster that's really effective. So, um, yeah, but I don't think I need to belabor that. You can see how much of a different kind of a day this is. It's much more of a hazy morning. It doesn't feel as early. This one here feels strikingly Colorado early. I mean, this is a time of day when the sun's coming up, and you could look at the Rockies, which would be in the distance to my left. If you look at over there, you'd see glinting diamonds all over the face of the mountains as the sun hits windows and houses. Uh, fascinatingly interesting uh, uh, thing happening. Uh, the only part of this that wasn't memory, and I reverted to doing memory afterwards, was the drapery. In these other ones, the drapery is memorized, and here I actually used something, and I didn't do a good job even a little bit. Uh, I overused the non-memory portion uh, in this iteration of this thing. So, yeah, but the color scheme, it's, you know, when you're doing imaginative work, it's a color scheme. It's, it's out of your head. So the idea of these purples interplaying however they do, uh, that's, that's part of the discussion, or the blues talking to the blues, however that works, is all part of a, an abstract discussion. So, um, you know, what else can I say about that? This isn't really one about fleeting effects much, though, so let's go back to that idea of fleeting effects. So this is classically painted outdoors. Uh, this is just a 9 by 12, I think, thing that I used in a, um, you know, I painted down the road. By the way, the road I painted that on is, is a, precisely the spot that Tarbell and somebody else were talking together about creating a summer school uh, along, along that area. So that's uh, in Piermont, uh, New Hampshire, just on the, on the Connecticut River. Uh, so that's a kind of interesting, interesting thing. But what's fleeting here, you might say, would be the sun's moving and the, these little lights on the trees. Some part of the trees, sometimes the tree is significantly in the dark, other times it's significantly lit. And that kind of thing is where you're hunting for your opportunity. What, what's the most interesting? What's the most, how much stuff do I want here? So that's a fleeting effect. And that's usually you're doing that based on design as well. So there are certain parts of the design, like the trees themselves, you know, through a several couple hours of the morning, those silhouettes aren't going to move too much. You don't have to worry about those as much. Uh, the, there'll be some movement of the light on the wall of this, some movement here. This might, um, you know, this in relation to that, this value here in the front of the house. I'm getting back my color thing. You guys can't see this, I'm betting. All right, there it is. Um, so I mentioned I mentioned the trees here that don't change much. There won't be there wasn't a ton of changing along here, particularly along this portion of this thing. Um, or the rooftop wasn't changing much. That took I mean just it took for a while for this to become a different color, with any of those effects. Um, so uh, but it's you know as I said this is just a um, a quick study in the class of a couple of hours I guess. I think I did an hour and a half. And came back the next day for less than an hour, whatever it was, but just enough to sort of make sure all the pieces were in there that I wanted uh, uh, for the kind of study it is, which is really for me just a study in light. It's primarily what it is. Uh, the, the interplay of, 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 of greens, uh, the, you know, the dance of the greens or whatever. Um, but no, that, so that's that right there is one of those sections. That, and the changing is can be an opportunity for you. So... But once you decide how much it's going to be, you don't get to keep on adding stuff because you won't forget your original concept. How much light you want over here? How many lights? How many? How many? How many? How wide that unit is, and how it plays in relation to other things. Uh, you're going to establish that in a second. One of the things you're going to find is you're going to need to establish things uh, for anchors. So a thing like this here, the roof line, and say this. These will be established as anchors. Even some of this. Things like this and these light, of, these effects. You know, these are these are key things in terms of anchoring your entire painting compositionally and eff effectively. And uh, you know, sort of the rest of it's sort of more negotiable. You know, as you evolve a picture like this, you might get more branch, more little p bits of information depending on how you're trying to close out the design. 
depending on, you know, if you're trying to create a pusher back here, so we jump into the middle, or if you're trying to actually uh, use the front, increase the detail on the front and gradually decrease it toward the back, but that's just conversation. I don't know if I can really be hugely helpful to you. This, this, is, a, this is a case where you're doing, this is a study for uh, demonstration, I should say, for uh, in the classroom. But all the way through this, as I'm laying in this painting, I'm looking to see where the folds ought to go. See, these are areas of interest that are part of the design. So the folds become fleeting effects. The model sits down and stands up, and these things change. Well, you notice the ones that you want not to change. It might be the V of the neckline or something like that, uh, or, or some aspect of the, of the pattern or something, or se several things. This, this pattern can move, it, this, these two spots, they can move in relation to each other. It could be a third one somewhere. So these things are all design issues that are all f available to you. So what happens, this is where a gamma would talk about the movable feast. And he would say, don't you see these things are moving, but you're going to see better opportunities. You're going to see something the first time, but you're not going to necessarily get it back the second time. So what you're going to be doing is you, you, you get what you can that you value, that you actually say, I think I'm going to try to hang on to that. And then you start saying, you're negotiating for the rest as, as time goes by. Now, this model isn't like outdoors because you can set the model down day after day after day in the right light. Same time of day, same sit, seated the same way. So there's a bunch of variables that aren't things you have to deal with. There isn't a movement of light, for example. But when you're doing the hair, for example, when you're doing the hair, the, the, um, the whole setup of the cheek to the neck, so the V down here, this little top point here, these things are the kinds of things you're going to say, and those are I'm going to use for anchors. But then all this fold stuff here in the hair, all these little accent points, wherever they wind up being, that's all grist to the mill of design. So once you see, say, a, a series of events happening, flick, 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 and you see something potentially making a game, you might begin to start thinking, is that pick up? Is that somewhere else? Is, there, is this plus something else here going to be participate in that? Do you see what I mean? That's all the design stuff uh, that you're going to find useful to you. And you're going to change one thing at a time. For example, if suddenly you, you have all these things going, you're sort of buying in that's a possibility there. You, you suddenly see a bit of hair sticking out here, and you say, oh. And, you, and again, if you're looking big, if you don't look big, these things won't help work with you. You have to really see the thing as a whole. But once you're saying big, you'll see that this broken, this, this accent with a light next to it, a broken thing, rather like these guys, will start creating this big game across here. And that's the thing of design. So, um, yeah, you're hoping that something new will come up and you get a better idea than the one you've got. And remember, the one you've got is almost always preliminary. Even outdoors, you have an idea that's basically there. And then there's, there, things happen. And sometimes that's, that's where the advantage is. A certain point of the day, you thought you were going to paint this time of day, but two hours later or an hour and a half, maybe an hour later, <laughs> you have certain encroachments of light that create better distributions of spots or better uh, areas of... of uh, the area of interest is now becoming more increasingly uh, uh, powerful as, as we move along. And then the sweet spot becomes this time of day instead of a different time of day. There are certain times of day, like in that landscape, where, where like this area here, where you don't see a huge amount of change no matter how long the day is. So you'll need something about that. That might be your darkest dark in this painting between several of these things. That'll be in that class. And uh, so you'll be using those things along with getting all your lights, you know. This is the whole thing. We're doing a floating thing in the first place, spotting things around, spotting things. I was looking for the lights, looking for the, the general impression of the entire, the general tonality and the general chromaticity of the whole painting. But, um, but the things you're talking about, the, move, the movement of light. So if, if the light starts coming around here and this dark becomes thinner, you'll be watching to see if that's better or not better. Um, if you have more contrast here, less contrast here, by the time this maybe has no contrast, you might decide you like that better. I don't know, you know, but that's all the stuff that you can say. Some of it's negotiable. Some of it could be like this. Nobody can tell how far forward that tree is, so it could be casting a shadow over here, depending where the light's coming from. And uh, uh, so it goes. I mean, but some of these things are negotiable, meaning that it could be a this or that. And you do want to watch out for that. Again, what you want to do is pre see it, try to see it in your imagination and presume that it's, see if it's going to work. Uh, or you, uh, or if once, it, once it comes by, you look at the thing as a whole or look at it in imagination. You have this thing mostly done. You look at these kinds of things and you say, and with that, with that, what have I got? You know, and that will determine whether you're going to add it. But it's always a compositional question. It's always a thing as a whole question. So... Um, uh, 
Fleeting effects, this is where I was trying to tell you in the last video. These are just memory studies. These are 10-minute looks. I would say study, you know, practice doing, it. and don't don't give yourself an out. Draw it as accurately as you can. Make these make these shapes as like as you can. The, you know, draw, draw, you know, really learn, really challenge yourself. But all it does is it makes you more aware of speed and uh, and the interplay of large things, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, trying to secure major relationships. Uh, and these, again, I've showed you in a recent video, the last one probably, um, these are one-minute poses. You just use things like that as your strategies for, for gaining the ability to hold in your imagination, in your memory, uh, shapes and shape relationships. Again, I've showed you this, and I won't get into it again, but it was a night at the opera, shall we say, <laughs> a night at the, a night at the, uh, at the um, recital. And these were all images that I learned that night. So fleeting, yeah, look at that. This guy's got his mouth in his cheek. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, so I'm holding enough of that memory. Uh, and I didn't make any of this stuff up. I did it on the basis of the values that I saw there and the shapes I saw there. So, all right. Fleeting effects, yeah. These are the birds I showed you last last time out, uh, but this is the fleeting effects thing again. Practice, practice, practice. Just literally, you look at that, and all you get is a blink. You shut your eyes. It's like shooting the lens of the camera, and then you see what you hold on your screen. Some people would again would say that you have to have an indelible impression. I never had that. I could just see it in in in, in my mind, but it wouldn't be values in my mind. It was conceptual. Uh, but I could I would have actually have already seen that this how this. This, 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 this series of bumps and, and dips played in relation to this thing. And the strange thing was, the more you see a group, like, the more you see more things together, the easier to see each of those things. So that might be a hint about this whole thing. I mean, I don't know what else I can tell you about fleeting effects. The one thing I think is very funny about fleeting effects, most people who try them, most, most of the time, you, for example, talking about it in a portrait, the last thing you want is a person sniggering. Right? So you can get a fleeting effect of them sniggering or something like that, and it just looks goofy. They'll be sniggering the rest of their natural lives. Why would you want that in a picture? And I say that, so that's, again, that's where the story starts dominating the, the, the beauty mindset, you know. But I remember there's a number of paintings by a number of people where they're trying to have, like, the whistling boy or something like that. And that, that one by Duvenek is, fairly, is quite successful, but... but um, but the uh, some of the laughing faces by uh, Franz Hals, they really don't work. And, uh, you know, they look forced, that are false. And it's very, very, very difficult to get those to look really good. <laughs> in the meantime, it's not your primary mission, you know, in painting. In my view, your primary mission is not to get a grin on somebody's face. Your primary mission is to make the page dance. But that's, that's where uh, certain things get easier for an impressionist, so to speak. Now, I've done plenty of portraits, and I always make sure, I always get the port, the, the, the um, the expression the way I want it. Uh, but you have to watch for the expression. You have to know when you recognize when you see it. And you have to start noticing that all you can do is arrange the blobs and bumps and, 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 and bits of, of shape and bits of form that, that interplay in their relationships across a face that produce that quality, right? There's no idea in your head about that. So the fleeting effects thing is driven by relationships just like everything else. And you have to be good at when this new set of effects, you might call fleeting things or transient things is happening, just close your eyes and let yourself see the relationships of the spots. And you begin to have ownership of those much more readily than if you don't do it that way. So, yeah. Yeah, that porch is funny. Well, I don't think that was uh, too... <laughs> that wasn't the worst thing we've done, but it is fleeting effects, I would say to every single student out there, they'll be worrying about fleeting effects. Be worried about things that stand still, and can you get all the beauty that they have? Um, there are reasons. Painting is a one-shot thing, right? So what you fix in this frame is there forever, and that's why I sort of smile about the idea of grins and things like that. Teeth showing when somebody's smiling. It just looks like that poor woman, she's got to keep her mouth open forever. That poor kid, you know, that their mouth is stuck open forever. They're fixed on this page with this grin. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So you might not even find that there's any huge advantages. If you're talking about figure groupings, I just simply scribble, like I think I showed you in the previous video about my drawings. I just simply scribble until I find that grouping or that, and I think most imaginative painters do. But when you're painting from life, I've seen some things look, look like they're in that direction a little bit by Anagoni, for example, where it looks like he's trying to paint a crowd. 
Um, I don't know. There are undoubtedly much better strategies than anything I've even run into for people who actually work on that as a consistent thing. But I don't want to pretend that I'm that guy. I think you should look around and see who else has conversation about that, who does successfully. I mean, guys who really are good at it. I don't mean guys who talk about it and do it badly or something. Um, but the again, one of those places you might go is to the um, is to the illustrator. Nothing really is about doing things fast. It's about methodical behavior. So if you can put one figure down that does something, another figure in between the two of them, adjust them until they both do even more of that thing, that action thing that you want. Just be that methodical about it. It was the one recommendation I could make. Well, you also have to have a good vision of what you're really trying to say and a good watchful eye to see if we're getting any closer to something that, that will do that job effectively, you know, to, to, to correspond with your poetry or your storyline. Okay. Well, that's that. All right, we'll um, we'll uh, leave it at that, and uh, don't forget to share, comment, uh, uh, and uh, subscribe. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, have a great painting week. <laughs>